Did you know that Christmas has come early for us here at X-Growth? Whether you may or may not celebrate, we've got a special gift made just for you. Tucked in our pod description, you'll find a link to your very own copy of the 2023 State of Account-Based Marketing in APAC Report. Want a sneak peek? Well, despite budget cuts, 0% of surveyed APAC marketing leaders plan to reduce their ABM investment. In fact, 65% view ABM as a crucial part of their marketing spend. Uncover the insights and strategies used by the top marketing leaders. So don't miss out and grab your copy now to stay ahead in the ABM game. What's up marketers and welcome to another episode of the Growth Colony Podcast. I'm Liza from X-Growth to tell you that each episode we bring in B2B leaders to chat about how you can achieve those everyday wins in the marketing world. Whether you're new to the B2B game, working at a leadership level, or even just showing some interest, we know you'll love the episode. So grab a drink, get comfy, and enjoy the show. Welcome to Growth Colony, I'm Alex Sipwell. Joining me today are my co-hosts, Vinny Romano and Shaheen Hoda. What's up? Hello, hello, hello. Vinny, what's been on top of mind for you this week? Any interesting insights or experiences that you'd like to share? Uh, well, my social.ai um, made it through to the final six of the University Technology Sydney Startups uh, Accelerator Program. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, myself and my co-founder, Wayne, pitched... Um, Pitched for half a million dollars, which is our current um, ask, um, and we are waiting to hear back the result off the back of that. So, boom! That'd be a great Christmas present. Yeah. When are you gonna When are you gonna hear about it? We should hear back today. Oh. On, um, today, or you know, it should be today. Man, you um, might get a phone call right now. Might be. It might, it might be ringing right now, but <laughs> I'm. Uh, I'm here. I'm here talking to you, gents. Of course, so. you're not going to answer it, right? Just because I might do. Yeah, podcast is happening, man. Shaheen, what about you? What's happening? What's captured your attention lately? Uh, my attention has been um, has been predominantly focused on probably the the shift in the market of what's happening with uh, with a lot of the tech organizations, and uh, and and that has translated itself into us being quite busy even though when we we're recording this is 19th of december and in australia land that uh tends to be holiday period and that is not the case so that has been what has been taking up a lot of my attention and time um at the moment sounds good for me i've been thinking as i'm raising my young daughter i've been thinking a lot about how Culture and the culture you grow up in forms your worldviews, your uh, your worldviews and cultural biases. Actually, I discussed this a little bit with you last week, Sheen, and just trying to see more of the world through other people's eyes. How this informs purchase decisions, and uh, how people see each other when it comes to status and these types of things, alongside how these ideas are going to affect the development of AI. For example, a cultural bias is going to be programmed into AI and how the what these impacts might be. So, yeah, you know, just the usual for me, I suppose. Just the usual. The usual. Yeah, just the usual. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's get into our big stories because we got a big show uh, this week. And first one is the 2023 State of Account-Based Marketing in APAC is out. Okay, yes, thank you for the applause there. I've got to mention this one up first. Uh, this is the annual report we do at X Growth, and there's been some shifts in the landscape over the last 12 months. It's a critical read for anyone at the helm of B2B marketing strategies in, in the APAC region, especially with the current economic shifts and tech advancements shaping the ABM landscape. There's been uh, big tech shifts since the 2022 report, but... ABM's continued growth across the region remains uninterrupted. By the way, you can get your copy of the full report in the show notes. And some key discoveries we uncovered in this year's report include a striking 65% of B2B marketing marketing leaders 
say ABM remains a high priority, even with tougher economic conditions. ABM remains resilient during this period, with new adopters outnumbering established practitioners 45% to 41 This trend is an indicator of ABM's effectiveness in diverse market conditions. And I was very glad to see that none of the marketing leaders surveyed plan to cut their ABM spending, and many are actually uh, wanting to increase their investment, signaling uh, good confidence in ABM's ROI. And then, of course, we've got AI's emerging role in ABM and the growing, growing integration of AI in ABM strategies the majority of leaders recognizing the potential to enhance efficiency and cost effectiveness. So start off with you, Shaheen. With the economy tightening, why do you think ABM remains a key strategy for most leaders? I think there are a couple of things to unpack over there. Um, you know, you talk about econ- the, the economy tightening. Um, I actually don't believe that as much as maybe I did six months ago. And I know some people might disagree with me on this. Um, I think that it is, uh, it is very uncertain economy, but, uh, but I think it's opening up. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more later on, but there are a couple of shifts that you start to see, um, especially correlation, correlation of, uh, of stock prices with what are the KPIs that organizations are actually measuring and how is that correlated to the stock prices, especially in the technology space. There is a shift in the past three months um, probably there compared to what was, what was happening earlier in, in the year. Um, I think, you know, ABM is front of mind and a key focus because a lot of organizations realize that the laser focus tactic of it. Now, I do want to point out, and, and this is a very interesting data that's coming out of our, our, our research, the ABM success index has dropped. So from last year to this year, I think last year we were 65 and this year we were 59. The success index meaning, and what we mean by success index is how successful do you find your ABM program? That number has dropped. And there are a couple of theories that I have in terms of why that is happening. We can talk about those as well. But even with that, still ABM is quite strong because a lot of organizations have been able to show there's a lot of, a lot more case studies. There's a lot more um, maturity in the market. The data is a lot stronger. It just makes ABM a lot more viable. Yeah. So why do you think it has dropped a bit? There are a couple of reasons, right? So, so one is there are a lot more people trying ABM. So when you have people who haven't done ABM programs before enter the market, what's going to happen is you're not going to succeed in the first round that you, you, you get into doing something, right? So you're going to have more failure. The other reason that I think people are having a little bit of trouble with ABM success is, is the marketers tend to go out and get external help, right? Whatever you're doing, there's a lot of agencies that, that help. What is, also has happened is because of the rise of popularity, there are a lot of agencies that ABM is not their core focus have started offering ABM. This could be because they've seen the popularity or an existing client has gone to them and said, hey, you know, I'm thinking of doing some ABM. Can you guys help us out? ABM tends to be complex. And if you have really not specialized in it and you're a full service agency and you do a bunch of other stuff or you're a full service consultancy, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And I think that is the second reason that is contributing to uh, to the success index dropping. Yep. Vinny, I know you're not um, hands in on ABM every day, but what do you think the implications of the growing number of ABM adopters, um, you know, that maybe uh, haven't had as much experience in ABM? What, what do you think the implications of that are going to be for the marketing landscape? Yeah, it's hard for me to answer because I'm not an ABMer. Um, I'm, a, I'm a social seller, right? Um, <clears throat> but from a more generalist perspective, if I hear what it is that Shaheen just said, what I found quite interesting was is that, you know, more people have actually um, adopted ABM um, in the last year, which has impacted the index, which means that, First time round, if you're going to be doing something for the first time round, you're not going to do as best as it until as best as you can at it until you've had a few goes at it. You know, really looked at your, really done a deep dive into your strategy and 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 started. You know, from a from a foundation of success. Um, I suppose the one thing that sort of crosses over 
between the ABM world and, and my world of social influence, social selling, um, and how the impact of, you know, technology is, is, is what kind of impact technology is having on it. I think more and more people are just finding ways of being lazy. Yeah. Well, actually, can I, can I ask one question? Can I want to ask one question that I think is related? And I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this, Vinny. Um, ha- have you seen any changes or any shifts in the past um, three months from the work that you're doing in your space? You see, we're, we're not we're not set up like X growth in the sense that we're you know running analysis and producing reports at the end of the year. So anything that I say should be taken with a pinch of salt. Um, but certainly things that I'm noticing, less and less trust is being put in to company branded messaging. We know that 83% of the B2B buy cycle happens digitally before prospect wants to engage with a salesperson. That's more in your enterprise sales where sales are actually required. Mm. We know that more people trust a regular employee over and above company branded messaging. We know that even more people trust a subject matter expert. We know that more and more people have access to the same technology as the seller, the buyer does, as well as the seller. And so what we're seeing is, is that prospects, buyers are looking for the best information when they want it. And they're getting more and more savvy with the landscape of technology that's available to them. And so I'd imagine this kind of crosses over into your world in the sense that how is that trust being built if all we're doing is spraying and praying, if all we're doing is is cutting corners and, and taking shortcuts on that path to build that block of trust, to increase that influence of, of ourselves. And so I'm sort of going around in circles here, but back to the point is that the same thing that we're seeing is the same that's always happened, is that the people that have the most amount of trust, the people that put themselves in a situation where they are the individual, they are the go-to trusted advisor, they will succeed over and above any of these, you know, spray and pray attempts from someone that that the prospect doesn't know, from someone that the prospect has never heard of. Yep. Why should I listen to you? Yeah, for sure. Like in an ABM approach, I can imagine that, you know, there are there are a, a multitude of different communications that are coming at the prospect or, or at the buyer at any given time. And the question still remains is why should I give a shit? Why? Yeah. So on, on the back of that, why, why should practitioners consider lever- or how should practitioners consider leveraging AI in their ABM strategies to maximize it? This is for you, Shaheen. Well, let me answer that. Okay. If, if you have a quick one, yeah. Automate where you can, humanize when you must. Boom. Automate where you can, humanize where you must. I'm a big believer in, in, in using automation to increase productivity and to, to reduce the, the uh, amount of mundanity of workload. But do not use it to the extent where it's so bloody obvious that you're using automation. That's such a good point. I mean, that's a solid point. Absolutely. That's how I'd answer that question. Sorry, Shaheen. No, I, I think I think you, you you did a much better job of summarizing that than uh, than I would have. Probably because I say it every bloody day. So uh, yeah, it's perfect, perfect. What, what did you say? So you said uh, automate where you can and and humanize where you must, right? Humanize when you must. It's very important that you use when. Yeah, that's great. That's great. It's a similar thing when you when you're talking about creating content on LinkedIn specifically, right? One of my favorite. One of my favorite uh, thought leaders and, and um, uh, people that I follow on LinkedIn, Richard Vanderblom, he, he summarizes it quite nicely in this particular context where he says, write for your audience, optimize for the algorithm. Yep. So human first. Absolutely. And use the algorithm, use the, use the technology, use the automation to optimize it. Not the other way around. Figure out how to do something manually first before you automate it. Brilliant. Shaheen, before we move on, anything else you want to bring up about this year's report? I think the most important thing we've touched on, which is the which is the success index, because remember, at the end of it, it all comes down to if you're doing ABM or if you're doing any kind of activity, any kind of motion, um, uh, marketing motion that you're, you're you're putting in place, is it successful or not? And 
keep in mind that there is an increase, there's a decrease in, in success index. Um, and, uh, and again, we, we look at that, we report on that. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very valuable if you're looking at that um, in an ABM motion to look at that report, um, but be mindful of some of the, some of the challenges that might be ahead. Um, and again, the data shows that they are having an impact, right? So um, kind of, T- uh, keeping keeping that in mind is really critical. So that, that's the only thing that I would, I would point. I think it's a, probably the most important um, piece of data out of the report, which is, I think, what is it? It's like a 40-page report, right? Yep, more. More. All right, let's move on. Check out the report in the show notes. So we're, we're going to move on to an article that's come out of MIT. Is first or third-party day- audience data more effective for reaching the right customers the case of IT decision makers. This study from MIT, the Melbourne Business School, and HP examines the efficacy of different audience data types in targeting IT decision makers in digital advertising. In contrast, first-party data obtained directly by the business with third-party data sourced from external data brokers and evaluates their effectiveness This study finds that first-party data, including demographic and contextual information, often outperforms third-party data in identifying IT decision-makers. It also explores factors affecting the accuracy of data targeting, such as incorrect profile, cookie matching, and the influence of individuals' digital footprints. This study shows that first-party data being directly collected from the audience often provides more accurate targeting than third-party data, which is aggregated from various sources. So, Vinny, the shift towards privacy and decline of third-party cookies, how is this going to influence B2B digital marketing strategies? Well, I, it's going to echo the thing that I said in the, in, in the first part I said, which was it's probably going to... At first, it's going to make marketers and people within organizations force them to be less lazy. Um, I think that eventually there will be other mechanisms and other ways that you can find to shortcut yourself to get the information that you're looking for. But if we look at it for what it is, I think this is a great thing. I think it's a great thing in the sense that it forces us out of that that lazy approach to, to, to use data that we're ultimately renting on search engine, search engine marketing and other platforms. I think that what this shows is that now there is no better time to be focusing on your professional brand and starting to position yourself as a subject matter expert to get yourself to a position of a trusted go-to advisor on a particular subject, on a particular subject matter. Because professional branding, the creation of content from your personal profile, in this case, LinkedIn, this is where people are going to search for answers to their questions, not just LinkedIn, but it's no longer just Google. It's no longer just search engines. It's a multitude of different platforms. And they want to hear from, in an organic sense, they want to hear from subject matter experts that can answer their burning questions. And if you're not out there answering those questions in your particular subject matter expertise, you're leaving money on the table. So now is a fantastic opportunity. Now is the perfect time to be creating content. Absolutely. And if you can't do it yourself, get someone else to do it for you, but get that information out of your head and into the stratosphere so that people can engage you. Absolutely. Um, Shaheen, before I ask you any questions on this, I I just feel you have a lot of thoughts. Uh, Anything you'd like to share? The article that you read undermines a whole industry in the B2B space. It like pulls the rug from underneath a whole industry that has been that has been growing in the past uh, maybe 10 years, which is intent data. Yeah, we're talking about last episode. So this, the fact that they, you know, um, uh, MIT did, did this research and I'm sure, you know, there there is a little bit of peer review that needs to happen on this. This is, I think this was published in November or something like that, or maybe a, a late October or something like that. But you have organizations that have been selling that dream that we're going to sell you this intent data. Um, these are organizations like Tech Target and Bombora and Six Sense and and so on and so forth, demand base that have been talking about, hey, we're going to give you information of like who's in the market 
and we're going to collect this from all sources. And the, the report has come out and said, hey, this is not going to get the, the, the actioning that information is equivalent to actioning completely cold information. And unless you have first party data, it's almost almost uh, useless. I think it's a very fascinating finding. Uh, as I said, there there definitely needs to be some peer reviews on this um, to validate this. But uh, it uh, it is it is a piece of information that a lot of people have been doing a lot of investing in. A lot of organizations have been investing in in, in third party intent data. And uh, I was I think the whole industry was kind of blown away by seeing something like this. And uh, and I think just like just like Vinny said. If there is more digging in this, if there is more evidence here, it has to make organizations, organizations have to become less lazy because previously you go after third party intent data. You're like, hey, I don't need to do anything. I just see this company is looking for this particular thing. Let's just hit them up with something. Now, the, the, the pendulum swings back. It's like, hey, there's no silver bullet. Now you have to do the work so that you collect third party data, first party data. And you can't rely on third-party data. It's a big shift. Why do you think this is happening, Shaheen? Why do you think cookies are going away? To, for what reason and the impact that it's going to have on so many people's professional lives? Why do you think it's happening? I don't, I don't think it's, it's just um, cookies, right? Um, so I think what, is, what, what it's done is – so there, there is cookies from advertising, right? And then there is – intent information that some of it could be collected through cookies that talks about, hey, we saw this company doing a lot of research on, I don't know, digital transformation. So they must be in the market for digital transformation. And the, and the challenges with that is, first of all, they're selling that data to everybody. Everybody, everyone who can afford it is going to have that data and they're going to be doing something about it. And then the second thing is the data is not identifiable at an individual level, not even at a department level. So if you're going after, if you see NAB that is showing intent for digital transformation, good luck finding the the decision maker on, on that front that's going to make that call. Um, and, and when you do find them, good luck standing out against, you know, tens, if not, if not um, probably high tens, uh, of organizations who, who've got the same data and are hitting them up, right? I, I think that is where the challenge is. And, and there's challenges here, right, Sheen, in APAC around uh, third-party data in non-English speaking countries as well, right? Yeah. The other thing is, oh, that's a great point. There's a lot of crap in intent data. Man, there is just huge amount of crap. A lot of these intent data are black boxes, right? And these organizations are, and I'm not saying this is what everyone does, but but really you're kind of trusting them that they're giving you the right intent data in, and it's coming out of this black box. And I know I've, I've spoken to people in the industry where in some situations they would like increase the flow and decrease the flow and they have to pay money to whoever's providing the data to them. So if they have to cut costs, there are definitely levers that they could kind of pull and the quality of that data, data drops. So there's all this stuff that, uh, that I think contributes to the lack of effectiveness of it um, from that angle, Vinny. So if you're an organization that's been heavily in third-party data, how, how would you react to this and what, what would you do? Like the first thing that you would do, how, how would you start considering how to collect first-party data within your firm? I think Vinny touched on this. Yeah, Vinny, we'd love to hear it. Quite simply, I would be looking at a number of individuals within your organization who have some resemblance of influence already in market who have the knowledge and the capability of being able to communicate that knowledge to your particular audience sets and leveraging organic social media and consistently but communicating it authentically with relevance that's what i would be doing i would be creating you know 
no different than an employee advocacy program, but from a sales and marketing perspective. Do not expect results straight away. It takes time. If you're gonna, if, if you have the opportunity to put money behind any sort of activity, it's going to be quicker, but you reduce the amount of trust that you're ultimately gonna get back as a result. Organic is always the first way. And what's great about if you can produce organic content with a call to action from a number of different brand ambassadors within your organization, ongoing, consistently, over time, what you'll find is that, yes, trends are going to change. Yes, messaging needs to change over time. But what you're going to find is you're going to find some really, really nice key bits of data as to what's resonating with your target audience. So who, what job title, what industry of people, individuals, because people buy from people, <laughs> right? What individuals are engaging with what topics, what topics and categories are resonating with those people, with your buyers? Whichever one is resonating the most, put media spend behind that. So let's move on to the next uh, piece of content. In Thomas Tung's recent blog, What's Measured is Managed, Earning Surprises in Public Software in Q3 2023. Now, there's been some interesting discussions around profitability and growth, and you've shared with us this article this morning, Shane, do you want to discuss it of, of why you think it's interesting? Yeah, sure thing. I think what is what is fascinating about this data is we have been, a lot of organizations have been talking about the idea behind profitability and how it's important to kind of focus on profitability. And that is a, that is a number that everyone talks about. Everyone who's been going on about profitability is like, yeah, here you go. We told you that, you know, the focus should be on profitability. But this shows that the market has switched. So in the past six quarters or so, everyone has been talking about profitability. And in Q3 um, that of this year, what has happened in the stock market, especially with the major 14 major tech companies, is that now the changes in the stock price is has the highest correlation with the growth of the company. So basically, the conversation between profitability and growth is shift back on growth. Yeah. And, uh, and the market is evaluating the tech companies based on how fast they're growing again. So I, I think that was a fascinating shift, um, a, a fascinating change in the market where, again, everyone was, uh, was, was talking about, you know, we now have to look at the profitability of the business and what's going on. And I think what you're going to start hearing is, uh, is a lot more conversation around we got to grow. We got to look at net new acquisition of logos. We have to we have to attract new customers um, versus the conversation that was there, you know, a year ago, where it's like now we have to just focus on our existing customers and grow on our existing customers. I think that is important, but the conversation around growth is going to come back, uh, and it's going to come back roaring, baby. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because I do want to get to our last section um, about. Uh, marketing in 2024, but what would you recommend marketers should do to recalibrate their marketing strategies now knowing this? Well, I think marketers are going to be a little bit frustrated because, uh, you know, the, the market moves very fast and they've been giving the message that, you know, focus on profitability and, you know, these are the things that you're going to look at and what they're probably going to get, especially marketers in APAC, where a lot of marketers are satellite offices from HQ US, HQ UK, what they're going to start seeing from the leadership is, no, 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 we want you to focus on net new acquisition of customers rather than uh, focusing on existing customers or, or, or something like that. So that is probably the message that they're going to get uh, very soon come down, probably in the new year, if they haven't got it already. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the last section. How to plan your B2B marketing in 2024. We've got a list of rapid fire questions. There's quite a few here. Um so we want short answers, guys, all right? We're going to start off with uh, Vinny. What are the top B2B marketing trends to watch for in 2024? I think we've already answered it. Um, the one that I'm, the one that I'm uh, looking at is the use of organic social content en masse within your organization, positioning, your, positioning teammates, team members, no matter what seniority level, as subject matter experts, using social selling and professional branding techniques um, as a way, specifically in B2B, as a way to attract, engage, convert, 
and delight um, customers at every section of the buyer cycle. I think that's I think that's the big trend. Yep, Shaheen, where should B two B marketers be investing the bulk of their budget in twenty twenty four? I think what you're going to see where there's not going to be a lot of investment is going to be events. Um, th- there was a massive shift into events, in, in my opinion, in uh, in right after COVID, which was which was last year, maybe even mid the year before. There was a lot of investment that went into that, and you're going to start to see that people are going to pull back from that. Um, and uh, and and one of the trends or one of the things that will be very interesting to keep track of is going to be consumption of content through. AI generated content. I think that's going to be a very fascinating topic as well. And I think that's going to have an impact on SEO. So it would be the impact might not be as evident in 2024, but I think we're definitely going to see a detail in the 2024 and 2025 where you start to see search consumption is going to drop. Where some of these, I mean, I see that with myself where I previously something I would go to Google, I don't go to Google with, with, and I don't ask that question. So I think that's going to be a very interesting uh, shift as well in the market. This is a question for both of you. We might start with you, Vinny. How do you see uh, tech, the gen AI and more machine learning shaping B2B marketing strategies in 2024? I got to echo um, uh, Shaheen's last point is that I think the market is going to become cluttered with it. I think that, um, you know, digital platforms are going to have their, <laughs> going to have their work cut out for them to, you know, try and be able to decipher between what is, what isn't. I think that the majority, if, from a trustworthy perspective, can this content be trusted? I mean, um, uh, and I think, you know, some of the bigger players are able to already detect what is and what isn't. I think that as a result of that, again, this comes back to stop being so fucking lazy. Yeah, about trust and th- authenticity automate where you can humanize when you must right if you're going to use generative ai copywriters large language models machine learning for you know cutting down your day-to-day work and being able to focus on more high value tasks go for it i say right go for it but don't be lazy with it use it for what it use it for what it is get good with it right but Make sure that it works for you and for the and for the reasons why you're using it. Don't just clutter the internet with bullshit. <laughs> I love I love the I love Vinny's passion here. It's just like so just like there's a mixture of passion and anger. It's just like stop doing this. Stop doing this. Anger. It's it's, it's not passion, it's anger. It's anger. All right. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. What, what, any other technologies that are going to be indispensable for marketing in 2024? What do you think, Shane? I, I actually don't. I've, I've had this conversation with a couple of marketers recently, and I don't think it's going to be as much technology as I reckon. And, and this feeds into what Vinny has been talking about. I think the, the pendulum is going to swing back a little bit from we have been the data-driven marketer for a very long time. And this is coming from a from an from a engineer, by the way, by trade, where I, I love data, but I, I think from the marketing perspective, there has been a, a massive push in the past, you know, couple of decades to be data driven. And what has done is I think it has killed the spirit of marketing and some of the other aspects, especially from creativity. As we're moving away from the third party data as we're 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 getting into the ai world as all of these are going to happen data is going to become table stakes like it's just not something that you you you're going to be focused on or, or, sorry it's not going to be something that is going to differentiate you what you then start to realize that we've got to get back to some of the creative aspect of marketing and and really need to double down that comes in the form of social content. It comes in the form of your thought uh, uh, um, thought leadership content and so on and so forth. So I think the pendulum is going to swing and there's going to become a stronger focus. Or organizations who do focus on creativity are going to do a lot better um, in 2024. What's the biggest challenge for B2B marketing and marketers in 2024? I think from challenges to whoever is going to dominate um, – and and innovative approaches, all of it is going to come down to what we've discussed, where your content needs to become a lot more genuine and a lot more creative 
you do need to start to have a focus on creativity a lot more than you previously had um, and uh, and start stop banging on about being data driven. I mean, it's great to be data driven, but I think that is going to be the, the biggest challenge for people. Of their, some of their tools are going to be taken away. Um, some of the tools are going to be proven that are ineffective and the the, the way that they need to compensate for that is uh, is through creativity and creating some of that some of that content. That's going what's going to be dominating, and and, uh, and and I think that is going to be quite a challenge for B two B marketers. Okay, so what unique challenges do B two B marketers face in the APAC region, and how can they be addressed in twenty twenty four? I think I think it's the same thing, Alex. I think it's across the board. It's not it's not um, specific to APAC or or anywhere else. Uh, I think what APAC is, it's the current the, the common challenge where your hands are a little bit tight um, because of restrictions that you might have from from HQ. Um, that I don't I don't think there's anything in particular here that um, groundbreaking is just specifically for APAC. How do you see the role of ABM evolving in 2024? Like we discussed before, it I think it's going to be growing, and our experience shows us it's going to be growing as well. Like we have a lot more interest come through the door. We tend to talk a lot more to, to a lot more organizations. It is becoming I don't want to say table stakes, but it is becoming a lot more evident that a lot more marketers are adopting it. And the reasons could be because of the success. It could pr- just predominantly be because a lot of, a lot more people are talking about it. Um, and uh, and that, that's simply what the data shows that it's just more people are going to be adopting it. More people are going to, are going to take an ABM approach. And what is going to happen is you hear this from a lot of people is like, Oh, everyone has a different definition of ABM. We're going to have more definitions of ABM. And, and that prim- primarily is because you can't have a cookie cutter solution for, for an ABM for different organizations. Yes, there are definitions that are just purely wrong, but there, there definitely needs to be a level of customization. There. Real quick, either of you have a book or podcast you're really enjoying for the, uh, going to Christmas? I mean, The Diary of a CEO with Stephen Bartlett is, is, is a favorite of mine. The recent episode that I watched was Morgan Housel, the, um, the author of The Psychology of Money. That's, uh, that's a good episode. Really gets you thinking. Sounds great. What about you, Shaheen? I have just had a listen to the most recent interview with Bezos. Mm-hmm. I'm forgetting the um, uh, the guy's name, uh, and he is an awesome Lex. Lex, that's right. Lex, uh, Lex something. Um, and uh, yeah, that, it's been it's been great. I mean, Bezos has changed for sure. He's uh, he's got a lot more buff. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um and uh you know uh, but he's got the, he's got the time yeah exactly he's got the guns out um but uh but it's it's you know i i have i have a lot of respect for him and for a lot of things that he's done and it, it's you know you, we haven't heard from him for a long time so it was great to kind of uh um hear from him again through that interview which was a very very long interview it was great. sounds good sounds good well i've been trying to get through meditations from marcus aurelius but i think it's going to take me a while to finish it off i'll let you know in Chris- after christmas all right let's wrap it up for the year your professional brand is what others say about you even when you're not in the room that was by jeff bezos a good way to uh sum up today's episode so have a great break and tune in to the next episode next year. Thanks, guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you in the new year. Today's episode of Growth Colony was produced by Alexander Hipwell and Liza Maywald. It was edited by Dave Semedo with additional editing by Liza Maywald and music arrangement by Alexander and Liza. Special thanks to Tina Wabe. We couldn't make the show without you. Growth Colony is hosted by Shaheen Hoda, Director of Growth at Extra. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Do you think you'd be a great guest or just keen for a chat? Send through an email at podcast at xgrowth.com.au. That's podcast at xgrowth.com.au. That's all for now. We'll catch you next week right here on Growth Colony.